We've made it to Exodus chapter 20. And it's a really famous chapter. You probably have heard about it many times. The Ten Commandments. And I want to talk about are the Ten Commandments for us today. So, Exodus chapter 20 and verse 1. And God spake all these words, saying. So right there, verse 1, and God spake all these words. If God spake, is it not important? God that made everything came down and spake to Moses. This is very important. The first four commandments that he's going to give are commandments toward God. Then the last six commandments are towards man. And these commandments, if you go by these commandments, if everybody went by these commandments, you'd it would be heaven on earth. And that's the way it's going to be one day. Everybody's going to go by these commandments. It's going to be heaven on earth. It says, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So the only one, the only God who could bring you out of the bondage of the world has wrote down some commandments that you need to keep. He brought Israel out of the bondage of Egypt. He brought you out of the bondage of the power of darkness. And he's got some commandments. And I mean, these aren't the only commandments. But the Ten Commandments really just sum up all the commandments in the Bible. And roll them all into one like a summary. Now look what he says in verse 3. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Now, how is that wrong? You know, people want to put down the commandments. People want to put down the Bible. They want to put down God and everything else. They say that the Bible's too strict. The Bible's just overboard. All he's telling you to do is just stuff that's going to keep you from heartache and pain. And he don't want you to do anything that's going to cause you sorrow and trouble and nothing like that. And if you have other gods before him, those other gods can't help you, so... Why would you want to go after him? Why would he want you to go after him? He doesn't want you to have any other gods before him. Just as a good spouse won't allow you another husband or wife. If your husband is worth anything, he doesn't want you to go get another husband. He doesn't want you to have five husbands on the side if he's worth anything. How much do you think your husband would love you if you went if he didn't care that you had a boyfriend on the side. Just like the Lord. He doesn't want you to have any other gods before him. Let's look at some verses. John 14. And verse 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You see, the only way you can be saved is through one God, the Lord Jesus Christ. All the other gods can't save you in a time of trouble. You can call upon the gods all you want to. They're not going to save you. Just like the Baal worshipers. They called on Baal. He didn't come through. The only God that's going to come through is the Lord God of the Bible. And he said, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Whatever you've made to be your little false god. You just need to go ahead and get rid of it. And Paul. The apostle Paul. The apostle for us today. He. Is for these ten commandments. And he. Goes by them himself. As you see in the New Testament. Look at Acts 14 15. In Acts 14 and verse 15. He says. And saying sirs why do you these things. We also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that ye should turn from these vanities unto the living God which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein. So he's telling them 
Turn from these vanities. Turn from these gods that you ignorantly worship. And turn to the Lord God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are there. And he said to go after the living God. Turn from these vanities unto the living God. These gods you have are dead. Turn to the living God, Paul said. So back in Exodus 20, he said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Then he says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. So don't make an image of this thing that you worship. But you see that today, people's got statues of things that they worship. When they really admire somebody, what do they do? They make a big statue of them. You know, they got statues of Kobe Bryant, LeBron James, Shaquille O'Neal, Michael Jordan, even some preachers. I think they got a statue of Jack Kyles. If you're a preacher, the last thing that you should want done is a statue to be made of you. You know, you'd think, you know, a Bible-believing preacher, the last thing that he would want done is a statue to be made of him. Now, I don't know if that, I, I doubt he had anything to do with somebody making a statue of him, but that would be, that would be your last dying wish if you're a Bible-believing preacher is for them to make a statue of you. You know, you don't want to make any graven image or a likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. People are really likely to worship that. Just like they ended up worship, worshiping the that brazen serpent that Moses had made. You know, when uh, they had to look at the serpent on the pole, they ended up worshiping that thing. So, but an object itself is not bad. It's just bad if you worship it. Look at Isaiah 44, 15 through 17. Isaiah 44, 15. It says, Then shall it be for a man to burn, for he will take thereof and warm himself. Yea, he kindleth it and baketh bread. Yea, he maketh a god. He maketh a god. Now, how does that make sense? He maketh a god and worshipeth it. He maketh it a graven image and falleth down there too. So he maketh a god and he makes it a graven image. But then look what he does. He falls down there too. An object is not bad. What's bad is when you worship it. He burneth part thereof in the fire. With part thereof he eateth flesh, he roasteth roast, and is satisfied. Satisfied. Yea, he warmeth himself, and saith, Aha, I am warm, I have seen the fire, and the residue thereof he maketh a god, even his graven image. He falleth down unto it, and worshipeth it, and prayeth unto it, and saith, Deliver me, for thou art my god. So you see that? He prays to it. He says, Deliver me. But the gods... The little G gods aren't going to deliver you in the time of trouble. So the Lord says, don't bow down to them. They can't help you. He says, don't make any graven image. They're not going to be able to help you. Paul talks against the images that people make. Romans 1.23, he talks about how they change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. You see, Paul backs up everything Moses said. Moses is against these. Moses uh, writes down how God is against having other gods, how God is against graven images. Paul comes back and talks about being against other gods and against graven images. Now he says in verse 5, Exodus 20 and verse 5, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. So, he says, don't bow down yourself to them. 
nor serve them. He's jealous. God is a jealous God. And people got this twisted today. They think that jealousy is always a bad thing. No, Je if uh, your husband or wife is jealous for you, that means they love you. It's it's uh, it gets it's only scary when you know you you as a woman can go to work and every guy in there is flirting with you, and you got guys calling you, and you got guys commenting on all your pictures on Facebook, and you got guys liking all your pictures, and you got guys uh, sending you friend requests, and your husband don't care. That's when it's scary. That means he really ain't. Loving you like he should. Now, if he loves you like he should, and you got all these men chasing you and slobbering on you all the time, he's mad about it, and he's a jealous husband. That shows that he still cares, and you're still in good shape. It's when he no longer cares. That's when you're in rough shape. God is a jealous God. He doesn't want you going after these false gods. He doesn't want you committing spiritual adult adultery with these false gods. God's because he loves you. He wants you for him. So he is a jealous God. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, our Apostle for today, is going to back this right up. Ephesians 3, 14. And Ephesians 3, 14 Look who Paul bows himself to. He says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's not bowing down to any false gods. He's bowing his knees to the God of the Bible. Then Philippians 2.10. Look at Philippians 2.10. Look who he, he talks about. You ought to bow your knees to. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He wants you to bow to the Lord Jesus Christ, every knee. Paul wants every knee to bow to the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, back to Exodus 20. God is a jealous God. Nahum 1-2. Nahum 1-2 says God is jealous. And the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. He's And he's come, he comes back fast. You know, faster than the speed of light. He's fast and furious. Way before Vin Diesel and Paul Walker and Jason Statham and all them guys. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversary. He's the ultimate avenger. And he reserveth wrath for his enemies. You see that? He's not somebody you want to make... He's not somebody you want to be messing with his wife, you see? He's going to get a hold of these false gods. So God is jealous. Uh, 2 Corinthians 11.2 In 2 Corinthians 11.2 Paul backs this up again about God being jealous. He just keeps backing the Lord up. In 2 Corinthians 11, 2, he says, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. See? But he, but he says, But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. Paul gets jealous because the Lord isn't getting enough attention from the bride of Christ, the church. Just like Elijah was jealous for for the Lord God because people was worshiping Baal. Let's look at what Elijah said. In first Kings nineteen ten or no first Kings nineteen nine Here's Elijah. Elijah says, And he came thither into a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, 
For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. He's very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. Paul also said, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. You, you, do you ever get jealous for the Lord that the church, the body of Christ, Christians you know, they're not giving him enough attention? They're just so amazed by Hollywood. They're so amazed by whatever junk that's out. They don't give God a thought. They don't give the scriptures a thought. And if you're like me, you believe the scriptures is the most amazing thing in the world. And it ain't getting the attention that it deserves. And you get jealous over it. You get jealous over it with godly jealousy. Jealousy is a good thing. Exodus 20, verse 5. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Now we know by looking at Deuteronomy 24, 16, that the children aren't punished for the sins of the fathers, but the father's rebellion going after other gods, making graven images and bowing down to them. The children grow up seeing that. They're going to end up doing the same thing. And then the children end up getting the same judgment on them. They're getting a, a, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children. They end up getting the same judgment on them that their fathers got because they saw their parents do it. They grew up in that. They end up doing the same thing. And they end up getting the same judgment brought to them. So the children end up doing the same sins their parents do. Children follow their parents. What you do in moderation, they'll do in excess. Many times. Verse 6. And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments, showing mercy. We're lucky, and we should thank God that he's a merciful God, a God that don't give us, a God that don't give us what we deserve. It's hell and judgment, a lake of fire. He says, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. And what does Solomon say? Ecclesiastes 12, 13. He says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Then John, the Apostle John, is going to back this up. 1 John 5, 2. It says, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. So he's, the apostle John's going to back it up. When you got Moses saying it, Paul saying it, the apostle John saying it, the Lord himself saying it. It's pretty good stuff. Verse 7, Exodus 20 and verse 7. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Let's look at some verses. Proverbs 30 and verse 9. Proverbs 30 and verse 9. It says, Lest I be full and deny thee and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. Let's look at another one. Deuteronomy 5.11 Deuteronomy 5.11 Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Let's look at John 16, 2.
Now, taking his name in vain has more to do with just saying GD and OMG. Now, if you're like me, I would I, I can stand here in the F word more than I can for somebody to say OMG. I'd just rather them say the F word. When somebody says OMG, it just it just makes me cringe. You know, when, mostly when people are saying it, they're not even thinking about God when they say it. They're just saying it. That's just what that's just what everybody says, and it's become a common phrase. Is O M G? Everybody says it, and it just it it, uh, it makes you cringe sometimes. And G D that don't make you cringe, but taking the name of God in vain it goes much further beyond that. For example. Like in John 16, 2, it says, They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God service. So he's going around. You, you're going to have people going around. You got people going around that are killing people in the name of God. That's taking God's name in vain. Uh, you got preachers getting up using God's name to make money. They're using the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to make a whole bunch of money. They take God's name in vain when they do that. Another way you can take his name in vain, 2 Timothy 2.14, you're going to see how Paul backs this up once again. Actually, 2 Timothy 2.19. Paul says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So you see that? If you're going around, you're saying you're of the Lord, you need to depart from iniquity. And if you're going around saying you're of God and you're of the Lord Jesus Christ and you're not departing from iniquity, you're not living a clean life, you're taking the Lord's name in vain. All right, Leviticus 24, 11 through 16. Leviticus 24, 11 through 16. It says, And the Israelitish woman's son blasphemed the name of the Lord and cursed. So you're seeing there, kind of going back to, you know, maybe saying GD or something like that. And they brought him unto Moses, and his mother's name was Shilimoth, the daughter of Dibri, of the tribe of Dan. And they put him in ward, that the mind of the Lord might be showed them. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Bring forth him that hath cursed without the camp, and let all that heard him lay their hands upon his head, and let all the congregation stone him. And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, Whosoever curseth his God shall bear his sin. And he that blasphemeth the name of the Lord, he shall surely be put to death. And all the congregation shall certainly stone him as well as the stranger, as he that is born in the land, when he blasphemeth the name of the Lord, shall be put to death. So you won't, don't want to blaspheme the name of the Lord, and it goes beyond just saying his name as a cuss word. So Exodus 20 and verse 7, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Now, Exodus 20 and verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day. Or it says, yeah, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt do no... Thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So the Sabbath is a type of Jesus Christ. It shows you the Lord Jesus Christ. A day of rest for God's people. For our Sabbath is the Lord Jesus Christ today. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. 
He says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus Christ is my Sabbath. All these commandments, we go by them. But when it comes to us keeping a Sabbath, Jesus Christ is our Sabbath. In Christ, you rest from your works. And your works, nor another person's works, none of those works can give you rest. You have to come to Jesus Christ and His work give you rest. He did all the work for you. You come to Him and you find rest in Him. So that's what this picture is when it says, Thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor any stranger that is within thy gates. Don't do any work. You can't do any work to get the rest. Nobody else can do the work to get you the rest or to get rest for themselves. You rest on the Sabbath. Jesus Christ you come to him, he's your Sabbath. He did all the work. In him you find rest. So the Sabbath is actually a sign for Israel. Look at Exodus 31, 13. The actual Sabbath is a sign for Israel. They had to keep the Sabbath. He said in Exodus 31, 13, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. But Paul's been backing up all these commandments, but look what he says about the Sabbath in Colossians 2 and verse 16. Colossians 2, 16. He says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. He said, don't let nobody judge you in it. It's, it's not about you. There, it's a shadow of things to come. The Sabbath's going to come back when God starts dealing with Israel again after the church age. But right now, it's about the body of Christ, and we don't have nothing to do with the Sabbath. Now look what else Paul says. Romans 14, 5. He says, One man esteemeth one day above another. Another man esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. The days don't mean anything. It's about, it's, you need to be doing something for God every day. Paul says, Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. One man thinks this day is better than this day. Another man thinks this day is better than that day. He says in Romans 14, 6, He that regardeth the day, regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day, to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. So one man esteemeth one day above another, and another man esteemeth every day alike. But every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. The day doesn't really matter. Jesus is our rest today. So you don't have to keep the Sabbath. And you, you're, the people that claim to be keeping the Sabbath today aren't actually keeping the Sabbath anyway. Keeping the Sabbath doesn't mean going to church on, sun, on Saturday. That's not keeping the Sabbath anyway. Now, Exodus 20 and verse 11, it says, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So, the Lord that's talking to Moses here, the Lord that talks to you, the Lord that wrote this Bible, in six days made heaven and earth. So, why would you have any gods before him? What other gods you know can do that? And it says he rested the seventh day, not because he was tired, but to set up a pattern to go by. He did things, you know, he didn't do, he didn't do it in six days because that's how long it would have to take him. He could have just 
snapped his fingers and it be there or just thought it and everything be there. He was showing you a pattern. You work six days and then they were to be at rest on that seventh day. He, he set up a pattern. And it's a pretty good pattern to follow. You need to rest at least one day. So he says in verse 12, Exodus 20 and verse 12, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Now Paul's going to back this one up big time. Ephesians 6, 1. Ephesians 6, and verse 1. He says, Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Ephesians 6, 2. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment, with promise. See, you see, now he's the commandments are getting into how you are treating other people. It was looking mostly how you were treating God. You know, have no other gods before him. Don't make a graven image when you got God to worship. Don't bow down to him and all that. Don't take his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. You see, those were commandments toward God. Now it's getting into commandments about how to treat others, how you ought to treat man. So he's, he says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. God gives you parents to guide you because you don't have no sense. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. It would be wise of you to go by what your parents say. Colossians 3.20 Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. So you see that? Paul just really nails that home. Look at Deuteronomy 21, 18 through 21. Deuteronomy 21, 18. It says, if, if a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him, will not hearken unto them, then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him and bring him out unto the elders of his city and unto the gate of his place. And they shall say unto the elders of his city, Thou this our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of his city shall stone him with stones that he die. So shalt thou put evil away from among you. And Israel shall hear and fear. You see back under the Old Testament law. If a son was rebellious and stubborn and a glutton and a drunkard. That was worthy of death. The death penalty there. Now... We're not living under the Old Testament law. But when your child is rebellious against you, you need to realize that what he's doing is leading to his death. And you have to get him, and you have to get him to understand that he's got to submit to you. If he's not going to submit to you, most likely, he's not going to submit to all the rest of the authority figures that come in his life. And he's definitely not going to submit to God. So you have to love your kids and teach them that they have to submit to authority. Then he says in Exodus 20 and verse 13, Thou shalt not kill. Now that's an obvious one. Look at 1 Timothy 1.9. 1 Timothy 1.9 Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the law less and disobedient for the ungodly and for sinners for unholy and profane for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers for manslayers so paul's backing it up again the law is not made for a righteous man but for the lawless and disobedient all right paul's gonna back it up again romans 13 9 look at this for this thou shalt not commit adultery Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Paul's backing up all, them ten, all the commandments there. He's basically saying, if you love your neighbor, you're going to keep the commandments. If you love your neighbor, you're not going to kill him. Now, people think the Bible is just so hard and strict. 
these is these are awesome commandments laid out honor thy father and mother you want your kid rebelling against you he says thou shalt not kill do you want somebody coming up in your house and killing you these are good commandments god just wants you to treat people right first john three fifteen. john's gonna back it up he says whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer and you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him so you see uh, these things it, it goes beyond just the action it's the thought process as well you don't want to hate your brother if you hate your brother it's like you're a murderer already in your heart you got to hate somebody in your heart for you murder them back to exodus 20 verse 14 thou shalt not commit adultery paul backed that up in that same verse romans 13 9 where he said for this thou shalt not commit adultery and then he said, Thou shalt love thy neighbors thyself. If you love your spouse, you're not going to commit adultery on them. If you love your friend and his wife, you're not going to take his wife from him and commit adultery with her. Galatians 5.19, adultery. Paul says it's a work of the flesh. And then in Leviticus 20 and verse 10, Leviticus 20.10 and the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. It's a very serious thing. The commit, though, do not commit adultery. He says in Exodus 20, 15, thou shalt not steal. What does Paul say in Ephesians 4, 28? He's going to back it up. Ephesians 4, 28. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with a his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth let him that stole steal no more but rather let him labor get up go to work earn your own things quit stealing everybody else's stuff paul also backed it up in that same verse romans 13 9 thou shalt not steal if you love your neighbor you're not going to steal from him thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor he backs that up in romans 13 9 Thou shalt not steal. You love your neighbor, you're not going to steal from him. Colossians 3, 9. He says, Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. So he backs it up again right there. And Exodus 20 and verse 17. Thou shalt not covet, thy neighbor's house if you're coveting your neighbor's house you're wanting his house thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife if you would uh, learn to appreciate and love your wife more you ain't going to covet your neighbor's wife as much nor his manservant nor his maidservant nor his ox nor his ass nor anything that is thy neighbor's it says, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. That takes care of everything else. You know, if you're if you're coveting, then you're just really desiring and wanting people's stuff, other people's things, the people in their life. And that shows that you're not content with what you've got. Colossians 3, 5. What does Paul say? He says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Admiring things so much that you're just wanting to have them so bad. That's idolatry. Paul says in Hebrews 13, 5, Hebrews 13 and verse 5, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have for he has said i will never leave thee nor forsake thee if you're content with what you have you're not going to covet everybody's stuff so exodus 20 verse 18 and all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking and when the people saw it they removed and stood afar off this is like a picture of what the white throne judgment will be like. God got the book open. Got commandments in it. 
and the people hearing thunder and lightnings and seeing smoke, and you're being judged by those commandments at the great white throne, the lost of all ages. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear, but let not God speak with us, lest we die. So they know they're not worthy. They're, they're feeling, they feel guilty in the presence of God. They want Moses to be their mediator between them and God. Once again, Moses picturing Jesus Christ, our mediator. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your faces that you sin not. So you see, God will use fear to keep you from sin. Just like parents will many times try to, put fear in their kids to keep them from sinning. Now, he doesn't give you the spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. <clears throat> He's not going to give you fear for things you shouldn't be afraid of, but you should fear him. And it says in verse 21, the people stood afar off and Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. And the Lord said unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, Ye have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. Isn't that something? The God that made heaven and earth in six days, He came down and is talking with man. God cares about His creation. And He says, Ye shall not make with me gods of silver, neither shall you make unto you gods of gold. You know, why would an almighty God care what you do? What is man that art that thou art mindful of him, and the Son of Man, that thou visitest him. He does care. He doesn't want you having gods before him. He knows the gods of silver can't help, and the gods of gold can't help. It's like in Revelation 9.20, they still worship the gods of silver and the gods of gold. But back there in Isaiah 3, or Isaiah 2, what were they doing? What does it say they're going to do? They're going to cast their idols to the moles and to the bats. They can't help them. Now he's going to talk about this altar in Exodus 20 and verse 24. An altar of earth thou shalt make unto me and shalt sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings and thy peace offerings, thy sheep and thine oxen, and all places where I record my name, I will come unto thee and I will bless thee. So he's telling them about the altar. They're going to uh, do the animal sacrifices on there. And you know we don't do the animal sacrifices today because we got the perfect sacrifice, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our Lamb of God. He's our once and for all sacrifice. But then look what he says. In all places where I record my name, I will come unto thee and I will bless thee. Where did he record his name for you? In the Holy Bible. And if you come to this Holy Bible, he's going to come unto you because that's where he's put his name. In all places where I record my name, I will come unto thee and I will bless thee. And if thou wilt make me an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it of hewn stone. For if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. So if a man simply touches it with a tool, it's defiled. Now what is this picture? This is awesome here. It pictures Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is the stone cut without hands. You see that? It's the picture. They're not allowed to use any tool on there or build it with hewn stone. Because if a tool, just a, simply a tool touching it will defile it. And Jesus is the stone cut without hands. Daniel 2.34. That's an awesome little uh, picture there. Neither shalt thou uh, go up by steps into mine altar, that thy nakedness be not discovered. See, if they put steps going up to the altar, then the person at the bottom of the steps could look up and see up their skirt, and they would see their nakedness. And that right there shows you that no, no nakedness is good. Just like Ham saw Noah's nakedness. It was not good. Any nakedness in the Bible, it's, it's not good. Just like when uh, the maniac, with the maniac of Gadara, he wore no clothes. The devil possessed man. So if they had steps going up to the altar... And somebody's at the bottom of those steps, and they looked up, they could see the person's nakedness, and it would be discovered thereon. But that's Exodus 20, are the commandments for us today. Definitely, most of the commandments still are for us. Obviously, things like the Sabbath, Paul comes out and says, you know, that's not. 
For us, Jesus Christ is our Sabbath. One man esteemeth one day above another, another man esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded his own mind. But you got these commandments like, Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not bear false witness. Obviously, Paul comes back and says, reinstates it. That is for us. So, yeah. You, you just got to rightly divide. You got to use common sense. You you read the Old Testament and you filter it through those Pauline epistles. And you're going to see what's for you and what's not for you. 